Last on Everdark, Damon and Julian head outside for the first time together. Damon finds cars too like coffins, hinting that he was more scarred by his time asleep than Julian realized. Meanwhile, Julian realizes clearly how he is now a vampire, the same type of being who killed his beloved parents. But Damon reminds him that a species isn't responsible for his parents' death. An individual is. And that individual is Kaimorn Losus. Everdark, Episode 30 Teachable Moments Damon knew that Julian was going to take off after the vampires the moment that Christian's parents arrived. He could have gleaned who the couple were from Julian's mind, but simply the scent of them gave them away. They smelled of Christian's blood. Julian's terror on their behalf told him how beloved they were to his fledgling. Christian's parents. Julian's practically adopted parents. Fragile. Mortal. Human. He could have stopped Julian easily and gone after the vampires that threatened the thorns himself. Not even a breath would have had to be spared ordering Julian to remain where he was, and Julian would have stayed right there no matter how much he wanted to move. His power over his fledgling was absolute, though he did not want Julian to know that. His fledgling must not fear him, and even if Julian wasn't afraid, the knowledge that Damon could completely control him would cause his strong-willed fledgling to chafe. And in this case, he must make his own decision and his own mistakes, though I will not let the thorns or Julian be harmed. So he merely followed after Julian, to keep him and the thorns safe, but also to see what his fledgling would do. Julian had taken five long strides and leaped, with that single bound, Julian had left the sidewalk and flown across the street, above the wooden fence and past the rose bushes. Julian had then landed silently in a half-crouch on the closely cropped grass of his backyard. His fledgling had not even noticed this act of superhuman strength and speed, because he was so intent on what was happening in the front of the house. Christian's mother smelled of wisteria and linen, while Christian's father smelled of leather and old paper. Their blood was rich and meaty. He knew that he would be refreshed from their veins, but they were not food. They were friends. Perhaps. From Julian's mind he came to understand that both of them were professors at the university where Julian's own parents had taught. But the Thorns were not adventurers. They were very much people of the mind. But even the athletic and fearless Harrows would have been no match for even the newest of vampires so the Thorns had absolutely no chance against these confessors who were trained in the art of war. But it is all relative, for these confessors will be nothing against my fledgling, let alone against me. Julian went for the one who had been in the backyard, but now was gliding around to the front. This vampire, his name was Gerard, Damon found out by skating over his mind, was thickly built, with dark hair and stubble covering the jaw of his olive-skinned face. He moved with the oiled ease of a serpent. Damon sensed the helm bloodline in Gerard. Leave at least one of them alive, Julian, Damon instructed. We will need to question them. He felt an acknowledgement from his fledgling. He wondered if Julian would be able to control himself once the violence started. He did not wonder if Julian could take this 350-year-old vampire. He knew Julian could. Damon stayed back at the end of the side path while Julian ranged forward on the balls of his feet. Gerard did not notice him coming, until Julian was practically on top of him, even though Damon had released the glamour from around them the same moment they'd gotten into the yard. He would ensure that no human saw them, but Julian had to deal with the vampires on his own. Gerard spun around just as Julian grabbed the back of his neck with one hand. Julian attempted to slam Gerard's head into the wall, but the confessor shot out a hand to brace himself at the last moment, and a cracking hit turned into only a glancing blow. Gerard then went invisible. Julian became bewildered. He still had a hold of the back of Gerard's neck, but he could not see the vampire he held. Julian suddenly curled forward, his mouth opening in an oomph as Gerard elbowed him. Use your other senses, Julian. You are not relegated to only your eyes, Damon advised. Close them. Feel. Just feel. 
You will know everything you need to know. Believe. Julian hesitated, but then closed his eyes. Gerard tried to stagger Julian, but Julian aimed a wicked kick at the back of Gerard's left knee. There was a distinctive snap. Gerard did not scream, even as his leg hung wrong. He clearly did not want to alert the thorns of his presence. But even wounded, Gerard was a seasoned, skilled fighter. Julian was no slouch. His fledgling was a street fighter, doing what worked from an almost brutal efficiency over making any fancy moves. This likely came from Julian working in bad areas when he and Christian couldn't depend on the authorities to keep them safe. Gerard tried to elbow Julian in the ribs again, but his fledgling twisted out of the way and rabbit-punched Gerard's side instead, all with his eyes closed. Another blow to Gerard's head, another kick to the wounded knee that had Gerard down. Gerard snarled silently and missed cutting Julian's legs out from underneath him. You must end this soon, Julian. His partner is going to either go after the thorns or come down here. Damon let his fledgling know as he crossed his arms and leaned against the side of Julian's home. Gerard must have realized that time was against Julian too, and sent a desperate roundhouse that brushed against Julian's left cheek, but didn't land fully, as Julian snapped his head to the side. A bruise formed, but would disappear once he fed. Julian wrapped one arm around Gerard's neck and caught the vampire in a sleeper hold. His fledgling's lips were skinned back, his fangs were out. A sleeper's hold could easily kill someone. Listen to his heart, he advised Julian. It was slowing. Gerard's eyelids slid shut. Julian released him. Gerard crumpled onto the ground. Julian, though, did not take even a second to congratulate himself. His head snapped up towards where the other vampire, her name was Celeste, was about to drop down on top of the thorns. Jump. Do not think in human terms, Julian. You can reach the roof easily in one leap, Damon instructed. His fledgling flexed his legs and then rocketed upwards, making a parabolic arc to land on the roof by Celeste. Damon floated to the roof to observe. It was then that the thorns reached the front door. We should knock or ring the bell, Liz, not just go in, Henry said, a concerned lilt to his voice. Don't be silly. Julian gave us a set of keys for a reason. Besides, if they're not answering their phones or email, then they will hardly be answering the door. Liz responded. There was a rustling as she looked for the keys. Damn, where are they? Don't you have them on your keyring? No, I put them in a special spot in my purse. Damon turned back to Celeste. She had bone-white short hair and a wiry build. Though smaller than Julian, she was quick and agile. She danced away from him on the roof, her expression showing a fox-like cunning. After taking out Gerard, Julian did not appear taxed. Instead, he was showing greater strength as the predator in him was aroused. A brief glance into Celeste's mind told him that she knew Julian was a newly made vampire by some master who claimed to be Damon. But everybody knew that couldn't be true. Damon was a myth. Or even if Damon did exist. He was asleep somewhere far away. He hadn't made this Julian into a fledgling, so she thought she could take Julian easily. She darted in, racing across the roof's tiles on silent feet. Julian dropped down into a crouch, hands loose at his sides, and waited for her. Ten feet from him, she leaped. She wore spikes on her hands that were now extended. Julian dove out of her way. She slashed at him, but missed. He swept the legs out from under her. She stumbled but righted herself and spun back towards him, outrage on her face. Celeste sent a series of kicks at Julian's head. One, two, three. Julian leaped back and avoided each movement. He was a blur. Celeste's anger and bewilderment grew. Stay still, she hissed. Try harder, Julian hissed right back. And she did. Snap of her arm across the air that should have slapped him backwards. Stomping steps, wicked kicks. Julian grabbed her right leg and tossed her. She regained her feet lightning quick, her gaze fixed on Julian's. Who are you? She asked. A vampire, just like you. No, you're not. You're right. Julian's eyes glowed red. I'm the fledgling of the king. Can't be. She shook her head. I am. She did not see Damon. He wanted to not distract either of them. But there was a touch of belief. You should not have come here. 
Julian told her. This is my home. Those are my family. The king is not real. She shook her head violently, denial in every movement. He is, and you are on the wrong side of history. Fear and anger made men dangerous, but they made vampires very dangerous. Julian's expression was murderous, and that cut through her defenses. She knew something was wrong here. Julian shouldn't have been able to take out Gerard. He shouldn't be this strong. And his eyes, they weren't right. She decided to bolt, seeking cover in the crowded high streets. Julian, speed and strength are not your only powers. She is going to flee. Stop her, but not with your body, with your mind. See if you can, Damon suggested. She did a backflip that would have taken her over to the neighboring roof, but Julian reached for her, and she hung suspended in midair. She let out a gasp, and Julian nearly dropped her, but caught her again. Sweat stood out on his fledgling's forehead as Julian used telekinesis, gift of the Ashier bloodline. Pull her back onto the roof, Damon ordered. Shaking and with more sweat pouring down his face, Julian dragged her back inch by painful inch, but it was beautiful to watch. His fledgling was amazing. I'll handle it from here, Damon said. We need to greet your guests. Hey guys, this is the last episode of Volume 2. Since this story was written serially, not as novels, the endings of the volumes can be a little abrupt. Why do we do this then? It's because we also sell Everdark audiobooks separately. The audiobook volumes have uncut, uninterrupted chapters, including the sexy chapters that we've had to edit. There are no intros, breaks, or ending remarks, just the MP3 chapters, which you can download and put on any device. Each audiobook is 15 chapters and approximately 8 to 10 hours of audio. The link to the audiobooks is posted in the notes. From below, Liz said brightly, Oh, I found the keys. They had no idea what had happened up here. Damon used the Iros gift to send Gerard and Celeste into a sleep that only he could wake them from. He then dumped Celeste unceremoniously down beside Gerard like two sacks of garbage. Julian was still shaking and sweating when he turned towards Damon. His fangs were out and he was rubbing his temples, trying to calm down but not succeeding. Damon embraced him with one arm while he lightly brushed his fingers across Julian's forehead. His fledgling let out a sigh of relief and dropped his hands from his head. His fangs retreated too. What did you do to me? Julian asked, but then waved off an explanation as he heard Liz fussing with the front door. Forget it. We need- Damon lifted them both off the roof and landed them behind the thorns on the walkway without Liz or Henry being any the wiser. He then gently patted Julian's ass to urge the young man forward to address them. Liz! Henry! What are you two doing here? Julian sounded strained and a little breathless, but he doubted that the thorns would notice, as they would be too grateful to have found one of their little flock. Both thorns whipped around to face them in surprise. Henry Thorn had his son's blonde hair, though that had turned an ashen color and thinned slightly, giving him a widow's peak with age. Intense gray eyes regarded Julian and Damon. He did not see Damon's red eyes, though. Neither of them would notice them at all. Liz Thorne's hair was also an ashen blonde, and there was a touch of her son's elfin features in her face. Her dark blue eyes widened. Oh, Julian, there you are. You're okay. She flew down the few steps to him and wrapped Julian in a desperate motherly embrace. Julian hugged her back a little stunned by her worry. Well, of course I am. But why were you worried? Honey, I watch your show. You and Christian promised something big this week, which can only mean one thing, she said, kissing the side of his head and pulling back to give him a loving but firm look. Vampires. Oh, Julian squeaked and swallowed. And I know it's foolish, but since your parents, well... Since your parents' deaths, I've always worried that you and Christian might follow them too far, she admitted. And then you weren't answering your phones, and I really got concerned. Blame Mother's intuition, but I was worried. You're a believer in vampires, then? Damon asked quietly. 
He stood a few feet away from them, arms crossed at his wrists behind his back. I... oh, Julian, who's your friend? He admired the fact that Liz Thorne did not let go of Julian when she finally, truly noticed him. Instead, her hands tightened on his fledgling, a boy she thought of as her son, as much as she did Christian. She sensed that Damon was dangerous, or perhaps she was just naturally suspicious of any men who were interested in one of her boys. Ah, uh, Liz and Henry, this is... this is Damon. Julian paused awkwardly. We're, uh, we're, we're dating. Dating? That sounds so mild for what we are doing. What we are, Damon sent to Julian telepathically. Well, I can't very well tell her that you're my master. I think she'd be a little more unnerved than she already is. Julian replied wryly. Why not? They'll have to be told sometime. Unless you believe Christian wants to cut all ties with them. Or use mind control on them so they never notice you do not age. No. God, no. Julian was horrified and couldn't imagine either future. But Christian has to be the one that tells them, if he's going to. Indeed. So, we must keep them in the dark for now, Julian. Henry stepped over to Damon. He was friendlier than his wife, but he wasn't exactly trusting either. He extended a hand, which Damon took in a firm handshake. Henry's hands were soft, the hands of a scholar, but he wasn't weak. Those intense eyes were fixed on him. Henry was trying to figure out things about him from his clothes to his affect. He flicked through Henry's thoughts on him and got... A little cold for being without a jacket, Damon, eh? Henry asked out loud. Oh, Julian, you don't have a coat on either. What are you up to running around like this? Liz tutted as she embraced Julian to keep him warm. But we were just, uh, coming from the car to the house, Julian said. Where's your car? Henry frowned as he looked along the street. In the garage, Julian quickly said. But you're coming in the front way. Liz cocked her head to the side. He read from her mind that the garage was out back. His fledgling was terrible at lying, to these people at least and the pathetic, puppyish looks he was giving Damon almost had the vampire king laughing. Why do we not go inside? Damon gestured toward the front door, where Liz's key still hung out of the keyhole. Julian has told me so much about you. Liz gave out a high laugh that contained a sort of sharpness, though, too. Well, he hasn't told us about you, Damon. Uh, what is your last name? King, Damon said smoothly. Damon King. Well, I look forward to hearing all about you, Mr. King, she said. Damon, please. All right. And as Julian said, I'm Liz, and you've shaken hands with Henry. Pleasure. After you, please. Damon tipped his head towards the door. Julian's eyebrows rose and sent telepathically, You're good at this. Reading people's minds has its perks, and I have more experience with people than you. But not humans, right? Not these modern humans, but people are people. You'll see. The trappings might be different. Cars instead of horses. Cell phones instead of letters marked with wax seals. But people are people. The four of them moved there as one. Julian, who was the one to use the keys, wiggling it a little in the lock before turning it. The bolt slid home, and Julian turned the knob and pushed it open. He flicked on the light in the warm and inviting foyer. The illumination came from a simple chandelier that hung over a maple-floored space. Julian let the three of them precede him into the house before he hurried ahead of them to turn on more lights. Damon slowly allowed himself to take in the space that was very much Julian's home. Wingate. He savoured the house's name. It suited the home somehow. He followed after everyone down an arched, tall hallway that led to the back of the house. On the walls, were framed photographs of Julian's parents in exotic locales. They were always smiling. Their expressions somehow intimated that they were always meant to be together, even in those rare shots where they might not be touching. A young Julian with a gap-toothed grin often stood between them, parents' hands on his shoulders. It was clear that the three of them had been a tight unit, three people who had genuinely loved one another, but perhaps more importantly, had liked one another. Julian took them to a kitchen. 
though it was far from the fire pits that he had seen in the past with these sleek metal containers. Appliances, Julian's mind corrected him, and rich stone counters. He could still recognize this room for what it was, a place where human food was prepared. There was even a fireplace, fitted with a spit along one wall. A wave of regret filled Julian at that moment as he realized there was nothing in this room other than the thorns from whom he would never feed from that was edible. Julian's exertions had burned through his slender reserves. Damon would have to feed him very soon. Julian settled himself at the kitchen island and gestured for the others to do the same. Would you guys like something to eat or drink? I wouldn't object to some wine, Liz said. Henry and I were just at the bistro you boys told us about. Most divine French onion soup and steak frite. But I find that I always want more wine after eating something so richly delicious. No problem. Henry? Julian lifted a wine glass that was a delicately blown crystal cup on top of a thin stem. I wouldn't mind, Henry said with a smile. Julian got out two glasses and was opening a bottle of red wine when Liz frowned and asked, Aren't you two having any? Julian's eyes went immediately to Damon before his mind voice asked, Are we? Can we? Of course we can. I would adore some wine. Damon was curious if the fermenting technology had improved since he'd imbibed some of the sour yet refreshing vintages the humans had made in Nightfallen. I'll get more glasses. You open that bottle so it has a chance to sip the air. Liz laughed, and she got two more of the delicate wine glasses down from a glass-fronted cabinet and set them on the counter. Julian poured out the ruby-red liquid that was made from fermented grapes. Unlike the vintages he had experienced, this one seemed far richer and more fragrant. Julian slid a glass to Damon after the thorns had been served. He took a sip. The complexity of the drink totally absorbed him for a moment. It's very good, isn't it? Liz asked him. Quite complex, he said. He took another swallow. Part of him just wanted to drink this wine and do nothing else until he had unlocked all of its secrets. But the thorns had to be put at ease. Julian was awkwardly spinning his glass. He took a sip of wine, but the taste was not blood, and young vampires were often too overwhelmed by their newly heightened senses to partake in other food. So, how did you and Julian meet, Damon? Liz asked. Julian choked on his wine. Henry had to pound his back while Liz rubbed his nearest shoulder. <clears throat> Sorry, Julian got out. <clears throat> wine down the wrong pipe. I hate it when that happens, Liz commiserated. Julian and I met over our common interest in vampires, Damon said once Liz and Henry were looking at him again. Oh? Liz did not look happy. She took a large swallow of her wine and her fingers clutched that slender stem too tightly. Are you a professor of some kind? Henry asked. Damon knew Henry would be investigating him the moment he had a chance so lying too overtly wasn't a good idea. Julian wouldn't want him to use mind control on them if he didn't need to, so Damon shook his head. He had not established an identity here. He had understood that much from Balthazar that vampires took on human personas and had written documents and a cover on Earth. Damon did not yet have such things. He wasn't sure if he wished them, or would he reveal the truth to humans once he re-established his rule over vampire kind as he had in the past? I am just a dilettante. I found Julian through his show. Those were the right words. Julian and Christian were actors of some kind. He did not quite understand Julian's explanation about YouTube and content creators. We corresponded and then met. I see. And are you of the opinion that vampires are real, Damon? Liz asked. He knew from her thoughts that he would fall farther in her estimation if he said he did believe, because she thought Julian's obsession with vampires was unhealthy. If he believed, he would be driving that obsession in her opinion. But if he lied and told her no, then when the truth came out, which it would, she would never quite trust him again to be truthful with her when it counted. I do he said simply. Julian coughed again. Henry pounded his back. On what basis is this belief centered? Henry asked dryly. Guys, let's not do this, okay? 
I, I believe in vampires too, and... Julian began. It's all right, Julian. Other than yourself, I think I am right in saying that the Thorns have understandable concerns about the type of person who believes in vampires. Damon interrupted. You don't have to undergo the Spanish Inquisition, though. Julian muttered, and his gaze flickered between the two Thorns, unhappy with the lying, but more unhappy with their pressing of Damon. They have no reason to trust me. In fact, Julian, they have every reason not to. They sense that I am a predator. They sense that you are quite fond of me. They are right to be concerned, Damon assured him telepathically. I base it on the very simple fact that belief in vampires has existed throughout all recorded history. Every culture has their version of immortal, blood-sucking beings, Damon answered. But surely you know that werewolves and vampires were used as ways to explain aberrant behavior in humans. Henry pointed out. Here is the thing about that theory. You can believe that all of humanity was too simple, stupid, or superstitious to understand the world, or you can accept that they were recording exactly what they saw, and it was the truth. They had experiences with beings who were immortal and fed on human blood, Damon answered. But there are many beliefs that our ancestors had that were nonsense, Henry argued. They believed the earth was flat and that the sun revolved around the earth. They believed the disease came from foul air. On and on it goes. True. Damon nodded his head. But you also agree that there are things that you believe to be true now that will later be proven to be false, correct? Liz swirled her wine in her glass. She looked half amused and half dismayed. And you think that our belief that vampires aren't real will be one of those things? Damon took a large sip of wine, and his eyes met Julian's. Yes. Well, I look forward to being proven wrong, then. Henry lifted his glass. Speaking of looking forward to something, where is Christian? Again, Julian looked at him in alarm. Um, he's... With the person he's dating, Damon said smoothly. Liz's mouth dropped open for a moment in utter surprise. Christian is dating someone too? And he hasn't told me about it? Uh, well, he... It's new, Damon answered for his floundering fledgling. Liz put one hand on her hip. Well, I think a dinner party is in order to get to know Damon better. And what is even the name of this man Christian is dating? Balthazar. Balthazar Ravenscroft. Julian got out. Say that name three times fast. Henry lifted an eyebrow. Damon grinned. Just wait until you meet him. Seeing Balthazar meeting the parents was going to be perfect. Iros had always been fascinated with new people. He enjoyed talking with them and finding out every single thing they thought. Good. Then we'll set it up. Liz took out her phone and went to what she thought of as her calendar. Julian shrugged and tried to say nonchalantly, Maybe in a month. This week. She corrected. Julian blinked. Wait, wait, w what? She looked up at Julian and said with definitiveness, Tomorrow or the next day will be best for Henry and I. You and Christian choose which one of those dates will work. No excuses. Join us next time for episode 31, Mirror, Mirror. If you're wondering what the difference is between the audiobook chapters and the chapters in the members' private podcast, the answer is nothing. They're exactly the same, only with the audiobooks, you have to wait until the whole volume is done, since we sell them in batches of 15 chapters. With the membership, you don't have to wait. We publish them continuously, just like with this podcast, and members are 15 chapters ahead of the public podcast. We do understand that some people aren't fond of subscriptions. That is why we have the audiobooks too. Check out the shop to buy the audiobooks with uncut chapters or join WraithRain.com as a member to get everything that has come out so far, plus access to the new episodes as soon as we post them to the members area. The Everdark Podcast by X Aratare is performed by Edward Fox, Adam Riley. Jay Thillis, Bruno Devant, Kelly Michaels, and Hannah Hart, with Liz Gentle as Seer, edited by Matthew Prince, continuity by Adriel Wiggins. 
Ever Dark is produced by Wraith Rain Publishing in association with Her Grace Reed Studios. Copyright 2022 by Wraith Rain Publishing.